the 20th century. Mankind leaves his home planet for the first time. In the middle of the 19th century, the French author, Jules Verne, had described a fictional journey to the moon. Amazingly, he had calculated the velocity necessary to overcome the gravitational field of the Earth. Many of his contemporaries, world-famous astronomers like the Frenchman Flammarion, believed that there could be life on the moon. I was rolling on the moon one day in a very early month of December. Uh, May, 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 that's right. Once in a while, black clouds could be seen on its surface. Were they dark swarms of moon insects? Or was it the smoke from the chimneys of lunar factories? Ladies and gentlemen, here is the latest bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News, Toronto, Canada. Professor Morse of Macmillan University reports observing a total of three explosions on the planet Mars between the hours of... By observing the surface of Mars, darker and lighter zones were noted. Were these oceans and continents? ...from American observatories. Now nearer home comes a special bulletin from Trenton, New Jersey. It is reported that at 8.50 p.m. a huge flaming object believed to be a meteorite fell on a farm... On Govan Schiaparelli's maps of Mars, long canals divided the planet. The astronomer, Percival Lowell, called them purpose-built irrigation systems. We have dispatched a special mobile unit to the scene, and we'll have our commentator, Carl Phillips, give you a word picture of the scene as soon as he can reach there from Princeton. In the meantime, we take you to the... Were these canals constructed by a superior civilization? ...are offering a program of dance music. These sorts of fantastic imaginings suddenly become a nightmare for American radio audiences. On Halloween in New York, the Orson Welles adaptation of the play The War of the Worlds is broadcast. The night's events were subsequently reconstructed in the movie The Night That Panicked America. Invincible beings from Mars have landed in Grover's Mill, New Jersey and moved to conquer New York. Hundreds of thousands of radio listeners believe that the play is a true report of a real invasion. They flee in wild panic out of the cities to hide in nearby hills. Do you understand? We're helpless against them. This is the end of the world. Was this only a fantastic invention? Or was it the foreshadowing of the fast approaching Second World War? Was it the early anticipation of the space travel that was to become commonplace in a few decades? Of nuclear weapons? Of a century within which the impossible was to become the mundane? All too soon, the Second World War becomes an ugly reality, and public attention is distracted from continuing mysterious events. On the night of the 25th of February, 1942, strange red lights appear in the sky over Los Angeles. The military believe them to be a Japanese attack. Between 3.16 and 4.14 that morning, these unidentified flying objects are attacked by the United States Army Air Force. No bombs are dropped, but three civilians are killed by US Air Force fire and some houses are seriously damaged. Three people die of heart attacks. A 
according to thousands of witnesses, one of the flying objects remained completely stationary throughout the shooting. It was inconceivable that it could have survived the many direct hits it must have received. After the attack, it flew slowly away and disappeared. Publicly, the military authorities dismissed the entire incident as a false alarm brought on by the heightened anxiety of America's new war status. However, the following day, the responsible commander, General George C. Marshall, sent a secret memorandum to President Franklin D. Roosevelt in which he declared his suspicions that the night's events had been hostile activity on the part of enemy agents. Autumn, 1944. The war rages on all fronts. Rookie US pilots returning from missions over Germany report remarkable incidents. They tell of mysterious fireballs appearing from nowhere and closely following their aeroplanes. They are unable to shake off their pursuers in spite of some breakneck maneuvering. These fireballs came to be known as Foo Fighters or, because of the Germans' famous love of sauerkraut, Kraut Balls. Were these Hitler's new secret weapons? German pilots reported similar things, but they ascribed the strange weapons to the Allies. There is no known case in which the Foo Fighters presented any danger, and as a result, they were officially considered to be weapons of psychological warfare. But this phenomenon was not confined to Europe. Flight staff reported similar incidents in the Pacific theatre during World War II, and sightings were also made during later conflicts in Korea and Vietnam. nineteen forty five the second world war comes to an end and at the scenes of conflict the rubble is cleared aside in sweden a country that had remained untouched by the war the first reports of unidentified flying objects appear in nineteen forty six they were called ghost rockets sometimes they silently raced through the sky sometimes they moved quite slowly the american ambassador shocked, reported to Washington. Recently, the number of reports about such objects has increased hugely. A member of the embassy staff saw one on Tuesday afternoon. The Swedes maintain that they have no knowledge about the origin of these flying objects. Actually, the Swedes assumed that the objects were German V-2 rockets that had been captured by Stalin. They demanded urgent help from the USA and Great Britain. Already more than 2,000 sightings had been reported from Norway, Sweden and Finland. More were coming in from Portugal, Morocco, Italy, Greece and India. These territories encompassed an area that far exceeded the maximum range of the Russian rockets at that time and as a result, the riddle the sightings posed remained unsolved. Mount Rainier is to be found 12,000 feet above sea level in Washington, the most northwesterly state in the Union. It is the 24th of July, 1947, a glorious day with excellent visibility. For many journalists and researchers, this is the dawn of a new era in the study of UFOs. Kenneth Arnold is a businessman and an experienced pilot who has clocked up more than 4,000 hours flying time. As a volunteer pilot in the Idaho Search and Rescue Service, he is on a mission in his own private plane he approaches the mountain and searches the glacier for a lost aeroplane. A horribly bright light flashed. It lit up the cockpit and the entire sky. It was like an explosion. And this was on a bright afternoon. And then it flashed a second time and I looked to my left and there was a row of very strange flying objects. They flew in chaotic patterns and at more than 1,200 miles an hour, twice as fast as any airplane. Arnold assumed that Russian secret weapons had entered American airspace. He reported his observations to the flight control in Yakima, where he stopped to refuel. His news spread quickly and at his next landing, a bunch of excited news reporters were waiting for him. Arnold described the strange flight movements of the object as like a saucer skimming over water. The phrase was coined, flying saucers. 
Kenneth Arnold's observation was by no means unique. According to a study by Ted Blucher, 853 UFOs were sighted by more than 3,200 witnesses in June and July 1947, and that was over the USA alone. The military was concerned. Were Russian secret weapons really menacing America? Ominously, statements from Canadian witnesses seemed to confirm a flight path over the North Pole. The then commander of the Air Material Command of the US Army Air Force, General Nathan F. Twining, drew on the 23rd of September the following initial conclusions. That the reported phenomena were real, that the flying saucers were the product of a highly developed technology, and that they should be investigated secretly and with high priority. The FBI was supposed to cooperate in the investigations, but refused to do so because it was not willing, according to official sources, to investigate flying toilet lids, hubcaps, and old hats. Practical jokers had repeatedly used these kind of objects to create hoax photos of UFOs, and these had been greedily snapped up by the gullible media. Despite all of this, on the 22nd of January, 1948, Project Sign started its work. The phenomena presented themselves to the Air Force investigators in a confusing variety of forms. Discs, cylinders, sickles, and fiery balls all carried out unbelievable flight maneuvers. Some flew on their own, others in formation. Mostly they moved in complete silence, but sometimes they vanished in a cracking explosion. Were the Soviets the origin of this technology? This suspicion soon became less credible when the CIA reported from Moscow that Russia too had started secret investigations into UFOs. As a result, the US Air Force took on an astronomer as a scientific advisor under contract. Amongst those in the know, two groups formed. Both schools of thought acknowledged that the phenomena were real. One group advanced no explanation, the other reported to Washington that flying saucers could be of interplanetary origin and that it would be advisable to put the military on alert. This report ended up on the desk of General Hoyt Vandenberg, the chief of staff of the Air Force. Without final and conclusive evidence, Vandenberg was not willing to act for fear of a general panic. In the meantime, new reports arrived. Two DC-3 pilots of Eastern Airlines, Clarence S. Childs and John B. Whitted, saw in the summer of 1948 this object. A similar flying object was observed during a clear night by the world-famous astronomer Clyde Tombaugh, who was the discoverer of Pluto. Tombaugh described the object glowing in a bluish light with a bright light shining out of six geometrically arranged windows. Tombaugh was absolutely astonished. This was an entirely new phenomenon to him that was clearly not a mirage, nor an aeroplane, nor meteors, nor northern lights. Witnesses who are trained to observe, like pilots or astronomers, made extremely credible witnesses. They had nothing to gain by reporting extraordinary sightings. Indeed, they put their reputations at risk. Other unimpeachable witnesses included the scientists who were working on the continuing development of atom bombs. They were amazed by green fireballs that appeared at the end of 1948 over their extremely secret research base in New Mexico. The astronomer, Dr. Lincoln La Paz of the University of New Mexico, was consulted in order to clarify whether these could be a rare kind of meteor. On the 12th of December, 1948, La Paz observed a similar object with his own eyes. He was convinced and concluded that these are no meteors. He took the view that they were rockets that emitted a white-green light and subsequently destroyed themselves. A scientist from the secret Los Alamos base declared that they looked like Hitler's V-2 rockets. 
where did these flying objects come from? Were they spaceships of extraterrestrial civilizations? Memories of Orson Welles' radio play were fresh in the minds of journalists and scientists when they discussed two pressing questions. First, were the atom bomb explosions that had occurred on Earth visible from Mars? And secondly, had those explosions alarmed beings on Mars? Other scientists thought that visitors from space were extremely unlikely because of the seemingly insoluble problems of interplanetary, let alone interstellar, space travel. The members of SIGN demanded financial help for their research, but the military had developed a new agenda. The authorities changed Project SIGN into Project Grudge. Researchers were told to find natural explanations for as many sightings as possible. Officially, UFOs could not exist. The scientific advisor to the US Army Air Force was an astronomer at the Ohio State University. J. Allen Hynek. He describes the situation like this. Uh, they were told not to excite the public. Uh, don't uh, rock the boat. Uh, and I saw it in my own eyes happen that whenever a case happened that they could explain, which is quite a few, they made point of that and, and let that out to the media. Things that the, the cases that were very difficult to explain, they would jump the handsprings to keep the, the media away from them. For their, they had a job to do, uh, to, whether rightfully or wrongly, to keep the public from getting excited. Mockery now entered the reports about UFO sightings, even though Air Force explanations often sounded highly questionable. August 1950, Great Falls, Montana, at the feet of the Rocky Mountains. Club manager Nick Mariana and his secretary inspect the sports ground for a forthcoming home game. Suddenly, he sees two strange flying objects passing by and he grabs his 16 millimeter camera. He shows the film to a few groups of interested civilians and eventually someone proposes that the film should be investigated by the Air Force. The official report, released to the media, said that the objects were fighters glittering in the sunlight. According to statements made by Mariana after the investigation, the first 35 frames of the film, on which the mysterious objects could be seen most clearly, were missing. This film was investigated repeatedly in the following years, including at the University of Colorado, which, between 1966 and 1968, did in-depth UFO investigations. With the help of a powerful computer, the university concluded that the film showed two disc-shaped objects with highly reflecting metallic surface, circa two miles in distance from the camera. The officer on deck of the US Marine, Delbert C. Newhouse, recorded this film on the 2nd of July, 1952. After examination by the Air Force, again a telling sequence was missing. The official explanation? Possibly a flock of birds. The US Marine Corps' own photo development laboratory contradicted this. Birds or airplanes would be recognizable as such in the analysis. The objects on the film are self-illuminated and are obviously under intelligent control, origin unknown. Confronted with this, the Air Force stressed again in a later investigation that the images were probably a flock of flying ducks. In the meantime, the Air Force had founded in March 1952 a new UFO investigation program. Project Blue Book was supposed to continue to portray all UFO sightings as false. Sometimes this task was nearly impossible. Saturday, 19th of July, 1952. The summer heat lies heavy over the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. 
Late in the evening, at around 2340 hours, air traffic control at Washington National Airport reports that seven unidentified flying objects have entered into the restricted airspace that made up the security zone between the Capitol and the White House. Numerous motorists report them as strange lights that move up and down and sometimes accelerate to fantastic velocities. Fighter aircraft are requested, but hours pass and it is not until around 3 a.m. that the expected fighter planes arrive. In the same moment, the mysterious flying objects vanish from the sky. When the jets have to return to base for refueling, the scare starts again. Only when morning breaks does tranquility return. The event makes headlines from coast to coast, but Washington has little time to calm the nation down. On the following Saturday, the same strange performance is repeated. This time, the unknown flying objects appear at around 2100 hours, and soon after, a fighter squadron is over the capital. One of the pilots, William Patterson, encounters the strange objects. When he begins to approach the intruders, the terrifying blue-white lights start to form a ring around him. Helpless and frightened, he asks ground control what he should do, but the radar observer, as powerless as the pilot himself, remains silent. Lieutenant Patterson experiences some horrible minutes until finally the UFOs leave him in peace. The drama over Washington lasts until dawn, when again the sky is clear. Under intense media pressure, the boss of the Air Force Secret Service, General Samford, declares on the following Tuesday, We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any agency of the United States. A little later, the Air Force declares the whole incident was only a mirage. Here, in sunny California, at the end of the 40s, a novel is created with the title Pioneer of Space. It is the report of a fantastic journey to the Moon, Venus and Mars, a science fiction story, but the author, George Adamski, cannot find a publisher. So he continues to earn his living in a restaurant on the southern slopes of Mount Palomar, on which the famous observatory is situated. Adamski is often called by his friends, Professori. He prefers to describe himself as a philosopher, student, teacher and saucer researcher, though without academic rank. In 1953, the breakthrough comes. Together with the British author, Desmond Leslie, he publishes the book, Flying Saucers Are Landing. Adamski describes in his book his first encounter with an extraterrestrial being in the Californian desert on the 20th of November, 1953. Orthon, Adamski's name for his new friend, tells him that all the planets in our solar system are inhabited. The book becomes a bestseller, and George Adamski becomes Professor Adamski of Mount Palomar, an error that he gracefully accepts. In his second book, Inside of the Spaceship, two years later, he describes his journeys with his planetarian friend to the Moon and to Venus. His fame was sealed. As an ambassador of his brothers from space, he tells mankind, yes, the moon is inhabited, as I have seen myself. Around its equator is a beautiful area where plants, trees, and animals flourish, and humans live comfortably. Venus, he reported, 
I saw magnificent mountains. Some mountain tips were covered in snow, others were bare and rocky, not very different from on Earth. Others were covered by thick forests, and I saw water streaming down the mountain walls in streams and waterfalls. In the country, I saw horses and cows, both of them a little smaller than the ones on Earth, but very similar. I was shown several towns on Venus, large and small ones. All the time, I had the feeling that I'd been carried off into a wonderful fairy tale country. But Adamski maintained that the main reason for the visit to Earth of extraterrestrials was the danger that mankind had created for itself through its abuse of atomic forces. Our brothers from space have come to rescue us from ourselves. If necessary, all people who want to be rescued will be invited to board the spaceships which will be provided. Adamski's credibility grows with ever more photos of flying saucers. His faithful group of supporters soon reach into the top echelons of society. An invitation from the Dutch Queen Juliana follows a private audience with Pope John XXIII. In 1965, shortly before his death, Adamski produces the crowning climax of his UFO picture documentation. In front of the house of Madeleine Rodifers in Silver Spring, Maryland, this film of a Venusian scout ship was shot. His planetarian friends had told him in advance that he should prepare a loaded film camera for the 26th of February and that he could film a spaceship from close up. George Adamski is considered by his supporters as the pioneer of a new form of cosmic thinking the space brother philosophy. I think he did me great justice. For Orfeo Angelucci, a worker at the Lockheed Aircraft Factory in Burbank, California, this philosophy is central. On the 23rd of May, 1952, he observes close to him two spherical objects of about one meter diameter, and a voice speaks to him. Don't be afraid, Orfeo. We are your friends. What starts for Orfeo Angelucci as a mystical experience of almost biblical proportions becomes an illumination of his spirit in the flying saucer. During a space flight, he receives from Neptune, his new space friend, warnings for the population of Earth. If the humans don't change, they will get problems in 1986. In a vision, Angelucci encounters Jesus Christ, who informs him that we are surrounded on Earth by extraterrestrials who live unrecognizably amongst us. They are here to bring us into a new era. The messengers of this philosophy are called contactors. Worldwide, groups of these are formed. For them, it is the true religion. UFOs are steered by superior beings who are here to help humans. Uriel will preside over a new age of cosmic wisdom and harmony. A far cry from the 1950s, when the shadow of nuclear destruction hovered over the land. Now, through prayer, it is time to charge the spiritual battery. Blessed are they who work for peace. Are these new philosophies an expression of the fear of an atomic future? Does the denial of UFO phenomena by the authorities lead to even greater speculation and fantasy? In any case, it was standard policy for the military and governments of all countries to gloss over sightings. 
From this point on, all important reports of UFOs were officially discredited and blamed on crackpot spiritualism or plain insanity. Thus, the Soviet newspaper Pravda declared on the 9th of January 1961, Civilians of the Soviet Union who claim they have observed so-called flying sources are either mentally ill or lying. In Michigan, USA, on the 21st of March, 1966, the town of Hillsdale experiences the climax of a three-week-long UFO sensation. Six police cars hunt unidentified flying objects. Never before investigated a UFO call, and they were skeptical. Amongst the numerous people who observed the spectacle from close quarters is the leader of the local civilian defense, who is also dean of Hillsdale College. After officials were notified, 36 jet fighters were immediately launched. The four lawmen chased the UFO for 25 miles at speeds of over 100 miles per hour. Finally, the Air Force investigator, J. Allen Hynek, arrives at the scene of the event, but by then the show is over. But exactly what it was they saw... Nevertheless, under media pressure, Hynek gives a press conference, during which he declares that the mysterious lights were probably marsh gas. Civilians and press alike feel cheated by this explanation and America jokes about the marsh gas state of Michigan. Alan Hynek's explanation had consequences. In the US Congress, the leader of the opposition and later president, Gerald Ford, demanded an official hearing into the subject of UFOs. Ford said, I do not agree at all that these reports should be so easily explained away. The citizens of America have a right to a more complete explanation than is currently given by the Air Force. The Air Force, under pressure, commissioned the University of Colorado to investigate UFO phenomena. There, Professor of Physics Edward Condon led the project. When he started his work in October 1966, he explained to the New York Times that it was the aim of his study to show that UFOs were hallucinations. Out of more than 10,000 reports of sightings, Condon's staff investigated only a few. For around a third of these, they could not find a satisfactory explanation. Despite this, Condon recommended at the beginning of 1969 not to proceed with further investigations on the grounds that they were scientifically worthless. In spite of all the contradictions in the Condon report, the military used it as an excuse to end Project Blue Book in December 1969. Many private UFO researchers adapted Condon's opinion. One such is the electrical engineer and scientific journalist, Philip Klass. Well, well, fortunately, about 98% of all UFO reports are legitimate. These come from intelligent, sensible people who've seen something, usually in the night sky, that they can't identify. They don't know how to go about investigating it, just as if I feel a pain in my stomach I don't know how to diagnose it. And some legitimate cases take many days or weeks of effort before you come up with a prosaic explanation. About 2% are either intentional hoaxes or self-delusion. And uh, fortunately, most of the hoaxers in the UFO field are not as clever or as ingenious they don't work at it. It's sort of a spur-of-the-moment thing. Mm -hmm. uh, UFO photos are very easy to hoax, particularly still photos. And I think we may see some of these. We have some photographs. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just like a trash can lid, and they throw it through and right, they take a exactly. shot at it. <laughs> now, what is this now, we're looking at? Here's one that occurred in the early 1950s, McMinnville, Oregon, one of two photos taken by farmer Paul Trent and his wife. They claimed it was a giant spacecraft that they photographed in the evening. It turns out that from the shadows on the wall, you can tell it was morning, not evening. Mm -hmm. It's a hoax. The Condon Commission of the University of Colorado investigated both photos and came to completely different conclusions. 
It is an extraordinary flying object. At a distance from the camera of about 1.3 kilometers, it is silver, metallic, disc-shaped, and the diameter is more than 30 meters. Newer computer picture analyses have shown that the shadow on the wall cannot come from the morning sun, as Philip Klass said, but rather from a shining cloud that is illuminated by the evening sun. The astronomer, J. Allen Hynek, was for more than 20 years the scientific advisor to the US Air Force. In numerous cases, he had given natural explanations for UFO sightings, including the Marsh Gas Affair, which he later described as the lowest point of his UFO research. Now that the Air Force had declared its UFO investigations ended, he turned against the methods of his former employers. In 1973, he founds the Center for UFO Studies, an organization where scientists and academics from different disciplines try to understand UFO phenomena. At the Center for UFO Studies, we have a computerized data bank that now has more than 75,000 UFO reports on it. And what is even more interesting, they come from, by latest count, from 133 countries. When you start reeling off in countries, it sounds like a roll call at the United Nations. And uh, even more interesting than the just numbers themselves don't mean so much. But the thing that finally convinced me that we were not dealing with nonsense is basically the caliber of the witnesses. Uh, many of the reports are made by highly responsible people, impeccable integrity, people in, in, in technical training, air traffic controllers and military and commercial pilots. Finally got to the point, and it took me quite some time. I finally got to the point, however, where I simply said, I can't continue to call these people deluded or nuts. They're, they are seeing something. Something is real. Hynek's experience over many years spent studying UFOs was used by Steven Spielberg in his film Close Encounters of the Third Kind. researcher, sightings of UFOs from long distances were of little meaning. From these reports, hardly any worthwhile knowledge of strange flying objects or their pilots could be gained. Very important, however, were the close encounters of the first to the fourth kinds. A close encounter of the first kind is an observation from no more than 150 meters. During dusk on the 11th of November 1987, the head of a construction firm, one Ed Walters, photographed this series of five pictures of an unidentified flying object, diameter about 4.2 meters, distance to the camera about 40 meters. This was a close encounter of the first kind. This was the first of a wave of new sightings that excited the 60,000 inhabitants of Gulf Breeze on the coast of Florida. That wave started in November 1987 and ended in the early summer of the following year. After some articles appeared in the local press, the first UFO researchers arrived. Suspicious, they undertook tests on Ed Walters and his pictures. Was Walters a gifted faker of photos? Never had so many details been seen on so many UFO pictures. This was suspicious, but on the other hand, there were now two more pictures from different witnesses. A flap is what UFO researchers call a wave of sightings. In the course of this one, more than 100 people from Gulf Breeze and its environs claim to have seen unidentified flying objects. One of them is the local deputy sheriff, Mike DeLay, who together with a coast guard observed a UFO. Initially, I, when I arrived here, I, I had a, a Florida Marine Patrol officer with me, and uh, we were dispatched to an unidentified flying object, so we, we were in the area looking. 
Ed Walters took one photo after another. At the end of the UFO wave, there were about 40 pictures. Amongst these were many that could not possibly have been manipulated or set up with models. Amongst the journalists on the local paper, the credibility of Ed Walters was beyond doubt. However, the skeptical UFO researchers wanted harder evidence. They provided him with a specially sealed camera with security devices designed to exclude fraud. Ed Walters took with this camera a photograph of this flying object. It was less than 20 meters away from the camera and only one meter long. UFO researchers called these objects scouts. Ed Walters explains his unusual ability to secure UFO photographs as a physical condition. Usually, he feels a buzzing in his head just before a UFO appears. This way, he managed to take many pictures, some with a specially built stereo camera system that better determines the distance and size of the UFO. Since 1972, Dr. Bruce McAbee has worked in the optical research department of the US government. He has also been involved in the SDI, or Strategic Defense Initiative program. For over a year, he investigated Ed Walter's photographs with all the resources of modern science. A long-term skeptic, he was forced to the conclusion that there were no signs of faking or manipulation and that the photographs are real. He has to set up each one and stage it. A spherical spot of burnt grass, 3.6 meters in diameter. That's nearly as big as the UFO that Ed Walters photographed from a short distance. In-depth investigation of the soil at the University of Florida could not reveal any natural causes. Are these the landing places of mysterious visitors? Again and again, these strange soil phenomena appear around UFO sightings. Most of the time, these are, like in Gulf Breeze, circular areas of burnt soil or squashed vegetation. Frequently, the earth has become sterile and water resistant. In 83, you can see a round, or oh, roughly eight foot spot. You can see a spot that goes off on an angle, which is uh, about 12 to 18 inches wide straight down through the yard, all depressed, and where it stops, it's perfectly cut off. This spot was created overnight, according to Harry Tomey, who shows his photographs. Definitely, it had some type of radioactivity to it, because it ruined my Geiger counter. Uh, the fact that I could never zero it at this property, so there was some type of activity that we couldn't identify that had taken place here. For an entire winter, no snow would settle on this area. Sometimes pressure marks can be found that look like the tracks that would have been left by the landing legs of flying objects that are extremely heavy. For UFO researchers, these are the signs of a close encounter of the second kind. These occur when a UFO sighting is accompanied by some measurable physical phenomenon that can be objectively observed, such as interference in TV reception, electricity blackouts, interrupted electrical systems, or immobilized vehicles. In 1982, Steven Spielberg made his blockbuster E.T. the Extraterrestrial. It was the story of a close encounter of the third kind, which is defined as an observation during which the crew within a UFO, or in its close surroundings, can be seen. <laughs> After the terror of the first encounter, E.T. becomes a child's playmate. E.T.? E.T. Ed Walters and his wife, Frances, reported from Gulf Breeze of a close encounter of the third kind. On the night of December the 2nd, 1987, Ed Walters takes a picture of this UFO. About an hour later, the Walters are already in bed, their dog begins barking. To look for the cause, Ed opens the shutters and is terrified. Large, black, slanted eyes stare at him. Francis also sees the alien, which he had thought at first was Ed's reflection in the window. Before the Walters recover from their shock, the alien turns around and vanishes into the night.
from many different countries, similar reports of close encounters of the third kind are received. In the south of France, farmer Maurice Masset discovered on the morning of the 1st of July 1965 an oval object in his lavender field. Next to the object, two human-like creatures as tall as eight-year-old children investigated his plants. When he came closer, Massey was paralyzed with a pencil-shaped stick. After this, both of the aliens re-entered their machine and flew noiselessly away. On the landing place, no plant grew until the soil was plowed. Unbelievable as these reports may sound, very often such an encounter of the third kind seems to precede a close encounter of the fourth kind. It was thus for Ed Walters in Gulf Breeze. On May the 1st, 1988, he took here at the shore with his stereo camera a picture of this UFO. Suddenly, the flying object appears above him. About an hour later, Ed awakes some meters from his camera. He has no memory of the time that has elapsed. The first known case of this kind happened on the evening of September the 19th, 1961. A couple, Betty and Barney Hill, are on a journey back from a short holiday in Canada. On Route 3 towards Boston, they observe a strongly luminous object of an uncommon shape. Later, the Hills cannot account for two hours of their journey. A year later, Panic attacks and nightmares drive Barney Hill to a psychiatrist. The therapist tries to revive the Hill's lost memory. Under hypnosis, Barney Hill relives his kidnapping in a UFO. In its drama, The Intruders, the television company CBS has included a scene with a close encounter of the fourth kind. What seems at first glance to be a science fiction drama is in reality a description of the bizarre experiences of people kidnapped by aliens. From most cases, a pattern emerges. Usually, victims are first abducted while they are still children. Very often, several members of one family are concerned. Descriptions are mainly of medical examinations and surgical procedures that leave visible scars. From men, sperm samples are taken. From women, egg cells. When I heard about the Hill case, I did not accept Stimulated it. by his own UFO sighting, and Bud Hopkins, the renowned New York painter and sculptor, has investigated many such kidnappings since 1974. His book, Intruders, uh, provided the material for the 1992 now, film of the same name. In fact, Hopkins has investigated it, over 500 cases so far, it, and he has published data on many of them. Owing to his participation in the research, Psychologists and psychiatrists have become aware of the phenomenon. Has frightening reality overtaken the imagination of the science fiction filmmakers? More recently, eminent scientists have begun working seriously on these kidnappings. For example, the professor of psychiatry at Harvard is Dr. John Mack. Initially, people just dismissed it out of hand. They said, this is nonsense. It, you know, somebody's fooling you, or you know, it's got to be something else. Uh, people come up with what they already know. It's probably some form of sexual abuse or childhood trauma that's been relived in this other form. And, uh, you know, I listened seriously to this, and then I looked at the cases carefully, and it wasn't like that. Some people may have childhood traumas and sexual abuse, but it doesn't account for that. It is an alien phenomenon, meaning outside our knowledge. It is foreign to us. And therefore, the only way to respond to this is, is with some degree of, of uh, nervousness and with the sense that this is 
tentatively now at least, unknowable, really. In the meantime, the UFO phenomenon seems to sweep worldwide even faster. Latest events, like the one on the German East Coast over Griefswald on the 24th of August 1990, don't leave any doubts as to the reality of these mysterious appearances. <laughs> but the scientific investigations are only the beginning. One thing seems to be clear, the results will change our perceptions of the world. There is only one more story to tell that makes the link from the beginning of the new age of UFO observations in 1947 up until today. We begin with Jimmy Carter, the 39th president of the United States. In 1976, during his election campaign, he declared to the press, I don't laugh anymore about people who claim to have seen UFOs because I have seen one myself. In his statement, President Carter described a luminous object that came closer until it became as big as the full moon. Carter is a nuclear physicist, and there are no doubts about his observation. In the light of this experience, he promised voters that he would ensure that, during his presidency, all UFO files would be released to the public. Indeed, under his government in 1979, the Freedom of Information Act was passed. Documents from the US government's secret archives have to be given to citizens, providing the information released does not endanger national security. Up until today, more than 1,400 secret documents have come into the public domain. Blackened passages, which have been censored from these for security reasons, show that the material available to the public, even now, is only the tip of the iceberg. One document, of July 10th, 1947, is related to the refusal of the FBI to take part in Project Sign because it would not investigate flying toilet lids and old hats as it described UFO sightings. In a handwritten note, FBI boss J. Edgar Hoover added onto the internal memorandum that he would be in favor of taking part in some investigations in the hope that the FBI would receive access to recovered disks. He wrote, for example, in the above case, the army had made it their own and they didn't even allow us a short investigation. Shortly after, on the 4th of September 1947, the FBI stated that a lieutenant could not attend a routine intelligence meeting because two of his men had died suddenly after the investigation of a flying disc. Did the FBI in the meantime receive access to a recovered UFO? According to this report, a story as incredible as any science fiction drama has been proved real. New Mexico, July the 2nd, 1947. A week after Kenneth Arnold's famous UFO sighting, in a remote area 75 miles northwest of Roswell, a strange object crashes. The farmer, one William Brazell, discovers the wreck the next morning. Brazel is undecided about what to do. He doesn't own a telephone, and it is several days before news of his find spreads to the Army Air Force Base in Roswell. At this time, the only functioning nuclear squadron in the world is based in Roswell. Major Jesse Marcel, a physicist and the first military investigator at the scene of the crash, remembers. I said, uh, it looks like balsa wood. It would seem, it would seem lighter than balsa wood. So I got my cigarette lighter and I said, I want to see if this stuff would burn. It didn't. The base commander, Colonel After William the recovery, Blanchard, Colonel William Blanchard, the commander of the airbase, called his press officer, Walter Hort. Hort recalled, I got a telephone call from then Colonel Blanchard, the base commander, telling me that they had in their possession what he believed was a flying disc, flying saucer. At the same time, Major Marcel was flying the wreckage to the 8th Air Force headquarters in Fort Worth and the attention of the 8th Air Force commander, General Roger Ramey. That, say some investigators, is where the cover-up began. 
Less than 24 hours after the flying saucer press release, it was retracted. The Air Force saying it was only a weather balloon. General Ramey and a colonel showing reporters a crashed weather balloon to prove it. But Jess Marcel went to his grave disputing the weather balloon story. At the same time, Ramey passed the mysterious material to the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, the most secret research and development center in the USA. The Roswell incident was investigated several times and its details confirmed by more than 100 witnesses. Despite this, it would have remained gossip if FBI Director Hoover had not insistently demanded a few days later to have access to the recovered disc. Up until today, the alleged recovery of four corpses, the pilots of the UFO, remains unconfirmed. The secret documents released up to this date yield no clear, plain evidence. The latex dolls of a Canadian producer are in any case not the pilots of the mysterious crash object. The circle closes itself with a man named Robert Lazar. On November the 6th, 1989, he declares on a TV show in Las Vegas that he worked as a physicist in the highly secret test and development center in Nevada, officially called Area 51, unofficially known as Dreamland. He describes the mysterious research projects like this actively and have in their possession uh, alien spacecraft and they are actively uh, undergoing analysis and flying them. They set up and produce their own gravitational field. Just as the Earth holds all matter down, they produce that same field but out of phase and it, it repels itself. The effects that can cause the way in which everything operates is is by all intents and purposes magic I mean it is so far beyond uh, our level of technology why did Lazar go public with this revelation according to his statement the qualification to work in area 51 is first of all top secret clearance especially for those involved in these pioneering projects the best brains in the scientific world are needed the producer of the world-famous Learjet, John Lear, secretly received test flight dates from Bob Lazar, who wanted to draw attention to events in Area 51. Lear makes arrangements to film a flight. But Lazar is discovered. Scared by the FBI and receiving death threats, he decides to go public with his knowledge. Bob Lazar's story has made many distinguished scientists pause for thought. For their advanced theoretical concepts for futuristic flight engines are in perfect agreement with Lazar's description of the propulsion systems that already exist in the UFOs of Area 51. <laughs>